I'm David Haverstick. I'm the Curator of Photography for the Archive Center. Uh, the Archive Center uh, is a division of the Museum of American History, and uh, we collect uh, documents, photographs, uh, basically flat things, as opposed to the rest of the museum, which tends to collect uh, primarily three-dimensional objects. Um, one of our prime uh, collections, one of our certainly most important collections, is the Scurlock Studio Records. Um, this is uh, a group of, of photographs and documents and so forth, essentially the uh, Scurlock Studio Archive. It's basically everything that was in the studio uh, in 1994 when um, uh, Robert Scurlock died and uh, the museum eventually collected the material. in a segregated uh, portion of the city. It was very typical of uh, photographic enterprises in African-American enclaves across the country. Probably every, uh, every uh, major city had the equivalent uh, of uh, a Scurlock studio. In New York, the most famous photographer, um, was uh, James Van Der Zee, and sometimes we call um, the Scurlock, uh, Scurlock Enterprise uh, Washington's James Van Der Zee, uh, or uh, we prefer to say that uh, uh, James Van Der Zee was uh, New York's Scurlock. So uh, the collection is rich in portraits of, family, uh, of uh, African Americans, and their families. It was essentially a portrait studio, but it also documented the entire um, uh, African-American community in that area of the city. Um, it tended to be uh, a fairly elite neighborhood centered around Howard University. Uh, a lot of professional uh, people lived and worked in the area, uh, and it formed its own a uh, very self-sufficient um, community. Robert Scurlock, who's the son of uh, Addison Scurlock, who, who, by the way, is obviously looking at some of his own photographs uh, in this picture. Uh, Robert Scurlock said that although the area was segregated and very um, uh, tightly uh, organized in a way, um, uh, he was, as a child, he was kind of blissfully unaware uh, of, of segregation, uh, and that uh, he couldn't really venture out much beyond uh, the confines of the, uh, the Shaw neighborhood. So um, it's a unique collection in many ways because it documents that particular African-American community, uh, but it's also uh, typical of any portrait photographer to begin with. Uh, and the work of, of almost any portrait photographer, but also with a very um, important um, clientele.
So uh, we acquired all of these business records, uh, photographic negatives, photographic prints, uh, a lot of memorabilia, personal things, mementos, um, some family materials. And um, we have been working with this collection uh, since it uh, became one of our official acquisitions in uh, around 1996. There are some 160,000 negatives in the collection, and there are perhaps 40,000 uh, photographic prints like this. And uh, this photograph, by the way, uh, is of Addison Scurlock, who founded the business in uh, 1911, uh, when he opened his first studio on U Street in Washington. A lot of uh, famous African-American uh, luminaries passed through the studio, including uh, folks from, from New York uh, and elsewhere. Um, they have a lot of photographs of Duke Ellington, uh, who of course was originally Washington's own um, anyway. But uh, there, there's a variety of uh, materials here, many portraits. Also, candid photographs taken elsewhere in the community. Um, uh, people, uh, their port studio portraits, formal studio portraits, but also people uh, at work uh, in their offices and so forth. Um, and since the studio lasted from 1911 to 1994, you can actually begin to see the changes. Um, of, of the world around uh, the studio and around that um, enclave. I, I think the, uh, I should say the Skurlocks ventured out um, in uh, 1952, essentially, because they opened a color uh, photography custom processing service in addition to their, their portraiture. And uh, so they did work for other photographers, um, including um, uh, white photographers, uh, and so they, they were interacting with the larger community. And, and then, of course, you've got that whole period of, of desegregation. Uh, and um, in, in uh, 1968, the, uh, the riots in the area. Uh, and all of those changes taking place. And as you look through the collection over the years, you begin to get a sense of how uh, the clientele of the studio gradually changes. As you look at the portraits, you begin to see white faces, Asian faces, and so forth, and realize um, that the studio, which at that point was housed um, uh, actually near DuPont Circle, uh, was really pretty fully integrated into uh, the life of Washington. The uh, Skurlock family uh, 
was always very proud uh, of the fact that uh, Jacqueline Bouvier uh, became a, a student uh, at the uh, studio, and um, they loved to tell that story. Um, I was skeptical about it at first, frankly, because we have a, um, a box of student records. Let me backtrack just a moment and say that, that what, the, um, what Robert and his brother George were doing was operating a school of photography. It was called the Capitol School of Photography out of the uh, 18th Street studio, uh, which made their father, uh, Addison, very unhappy. Uh, some of the family lore is that, um, uh, that there were arguments about this. Addison said, well, you're training my competition. Uh, I don't want that. Um, but uh, Robert uh, was the, pretty much the genius behind that. Robert had been in um, the Tuskegee Airmen during the war, and he realized uh, when he got out that there was a critical need for jobs among uh, other members of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, and other African Americans who had been uh, in the service. So he thought that uh, not only would a, uh, a school of photography operating out of the studio be a great boon uh, to these people, but it also uh, was, uh, it could be lucrative uh, and so forth. So he ran that for about four years. Now there's a box, I was starting to say, there's a box of student records. There's a card for each student uh, who attended the school. Now, most of the programs they had were one, two, and three-year programs. Uh, this was not uh, a case of, of uh, you know, uh, two-week short courses or anything like that. Um, people signed up uh, to get a, uh, a certificate of, uh, of study there, um, and that was all very official. But there was no card for, for Jacqueline Bouvier. And uh, I did more, more digging, and, and it was pretty clear that uh, what, what she did was maybe take a one-week short course there. Uh, the newspaper, the Times Mirror, either sent her there, or it might have been her own idea. We don't, we don't know about that. Um, a Scurlock uh, relative, uh, Jeff Fearing, who wrote his dissertation um, on the Scurlock studio, kind of questions the motivation of, of sending a, a um, uh, you know, a, a white woman reporter to an African American school. Uh, and he's, he was not too sure about what was behind all that. But um, we may never know that. We may never know exactly the motivation uh, or why other regular photographers at the uh, Times Mirror uh, couldn't just teach her the ropes of how to operate a, a, a press camera to do these interviews. I mean, she did not need to be um, a, a highly trained photographer. She just needed to be able to operate the camera. Uh, so we don't know. This might have been her, her own initiative. Um, so uh, I, I looked into that. Eventually, I found, I did find a letter that corroborated her presence there. <laughs> Many years later, in 1976, um, when uh, Robert Skurlock was preparing an exhibition of his father Addison's photographs for display at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, um, which was one of their bicentennial exhibitions. And we have that entire set of, of uh, photographs that was shown at the Corcoran.
rather late in the day, um, Robert decided to try to get a book or a catalog uh, published uh, in connection with the exhibition. So he wrote to Viking Press, where uh, Jacqueline Onassis, uh, now Onassis, was um, uh, an editor. And it's a very, it's a very curious letter because he, he says, uh, uh, I hope, uh, you know, dear Mrs. Onassis, I hope you remember me as your old teacher. Um, so to me, that pretty much corroborates that. <laughs> and then he said, um, I've, I've been following your career since then. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he asks he's for a favor, essentially. Uh, he's kind of saying, as your, as your old mentor uh, and teacher, do you think you could see your way clear to publishing a book in connection with this uh, exhibition of my father's photographs? Of course, her assistant wrote back, and uh, her assistant says, yes, Mrs. Onassis does remember you fondly, but I hope you realize that we can't produce a book in two months. Um, and so that, uh, that fell by the wayside, of course, and there was no book. There was a publication a small publication with the exhibition, but not a major uh, book. It so happens that most of the collection, most of the Scurlock collection is housed uh, mm -hmm. in one room mm -hmm. um, at the museum here in the, uh, the basement, uh, which is not permanent. Uh, it'll be moving eventually to a different location, uh, but it's accessible. And we don't have a permanent exhibit um, of, of uh, the material at all, but we've had a number of small exhibits uh, in the museum over the years, um, and there has been one major exhibition in the museum. That's the one that I referred to before, um, which was shown on the second floor of this museum. Uh, it was uh, entitled uh, The Scurlock Studio in Black Washington, picture, Picturing the Promise. I think actually it goes the other way. Hard to tell. Uh, but. Uh, uh, and this is one of the most popular Scurlock photographs here. Uh, a group of girls and possibly one boy, uh, we're not sure, uh, going to uh, uh, Highland Beach, which was a segregated uh, beach near Annapolis, uh, for an outing. Um, so they did a major exhibition. Uh, it was in collaboration with us, using our collection, uh, and a few things bother, uh, borrowed from other other collections elsewhere, um, including objects and artifacts. Um, and um, that was a major exhibition, and this book accompanied it. Uh, I have a chapter in the book, uh, and a number of other people wrote for it. It's a very rich uh, uh, collection of essays and reproductions of photographs, and um, it's celebratory in nature. It's, it's saying, look at this wonderful collection that we have. Um, and we do make it available. Um, people can make an appointment to come to the Archive Center uh, and look at the photographs. Some of the uh, negatives, most of the negatives, are actually in cold storage. But uh, given enough notice, we can remove those from cold storage and even show people the negatives. Uh, but certainly most people will want to uh, look at the, the uh, prints. Uh, and so we can show those to people. We have uh, a lot of digitized material online that people can look at. Um, and so people can do research uh, with the material here. And from time to time there will be other uh, small exhibitions. Perhaps in a number of years uh, there might be another major exhibition. Um, I think there's a lot of hidden um, 
uh, interesting material among the negatives, for example. Um, I think we're going to get some surprises as we continue to go through those negatives. collections are there uh, and available for selection uh, for exhibitions. So it, uh, uh, and that's, that's very typical. Uh, the Archive Center here is a little different from uh, most of the uh, curatorial units in this museum in that we're really set up for, um, for research. Um, this room that you see here is actually uh, a substitute room, a temporary space for research uh, during the uh, museum's West Wing renovation. Our regular uh, research area and offices are currently closed because they're within the, the West Wing. We can basically accommodate four people here at a time. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, the other space, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to have uh, eight researchers at a time whether it's eight people, you know, working on various aspects of the uh, uh, Scurlock collection or working with eight different collections. Um, we provide that service and we're really, really set up for it. Uh, certainly the museum has done a lot of uh, archival collecting um, since the Archive Center was opened in uh, 1983. And, uh, it's quite possible that if the Archive Center hadn't been developed in advance, we might not have been in a position to accept the Scurlock collection. Uh, it might, might have gone someplace else. Um, the, uh, the Scurlock collection is quite popular. Uh, a lot of researchers have come to look at it, and uh, a lot of uh, images have been reproduced from it by a wide variety of, uh, of people since we've had the uh, collection. So uh, it gets considerable use. Uh, some of the same images, uh, like this one, get reproduced over and over again. There are a lot of uh, favorites. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of what we might call greatest hits. Um, people, people will look for portraits of specific uh, individuals who were photographed by the Scurlocks because they have, uh, you know, it's rich in, in portraits of Howard University professors, um, medical, uh, medical people, uh, you know, professors from the, from the Howard Medical School, um, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, a number of, of uh, uh, as I say, outside uh, people. There's even a, an image here, well, there's an image, by, uh, an image of a, uh, and I won't be able to lay my hands on it, uh, even photographed a, uh, a, a black um, British composer uh, when he passed through Washington. So his, uh, his portrait is in here and he's sitting at the piano. Um, and, uh, and a number of other people politicians, too. Um, Howard University, uh, having had government support, has always had a lot of interaction uh, with the presidency. Uh, so we've got pictures of, of uh, Harry Truman, Franklin Roosevelt speaking at Howard University, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, taking tours of the campus, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, it's not just Washington history. Uh, and it's not just um, the, uh, the story of this one uh, fairly enclosed um, uh, neighborhood. Um, it's really about, you know, uh, the, the United States as well. So there's a lot of American history uh, in general in it. Uh, and it's a great legacy for all of these, these different reasons. 
And again, I think looking at it in totality, its totality, um, I like the fact that it is a, <clears throat> um, a resource uh, about uh, you know, photography, photographic studios, and so forth in the 20th century. I've often thought that if this museum wanted to do a period setting uh, of a, a photographic studio, which might be possible in our digital age, uh, soon people are going to forget what dark rooms looked like and so forth. Uh, and I thought that a um, perhaps a dark room, uh, period room uh, of Scurlock materials. Uh, the studio was very thoroughly photographed by uh, Smithsonian photographers uh, before we removed everything. And uh, so we've got documentation of what it looked like. Uh, the museum, not in the Archive Center, but the museum does have some of the studio furniture, cameras, uh, equipment and so forth that were used. And so it, it is in many ways so typical of a photographic studio. With everything there, uh, I, I think it's just uh, uh, has marvelous possibilities. So it's like it's like many other collections in the museum. Uh, it's available for research, uh, and it's available for uh, selection for exhibitions of various kinds. Um, it's available for publication and so forth. So I um, and there are you know, various aspects of the Scurlock operation that are unusual, like that school of photography, and then after the school closed, when, when they started that uh, color processing service. Um, so it has many, many unique qualities, and obviously um, there's a lot of portraiture that looks like portraiture from any other studio, but they also have their own unique touch. Uh, and that's still talked about, the, uh, the so-called Scurlock look, um, in which they and many other African-American photographers were trying to show a dignified view of their African-American subjects. And, and sometimes they were more sympathetic uh, than white photographers were. This was something that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois advocated in particular. Uh, and there are Scurlock, uh, Scurlock photographs of Du Bois, uh, too, among other people. Uh, but Du Bois uh, urged um, African Americans to go into photography and, and to serve, uh, to be able to serve that community with a sympathetic, uh, a sympathetic eye.